storm! <laughs> oh boy, oh, come on, please, please, oh please. <laughs> rain, damn it, rain! Uh, if only I'd stayed ashore and not gone fishing ten years ago. Then I'd be rich, and I wouldn't be here. Just a happy thought. If only I had a happy thought to keep me company, just one. Then, when I'd get lonely, I'd just think that thought. Land? Oh, oh my god! Land! <laughs> I'm saved! <laughs> ah, but which direction should I head for? I don't... Who is that? A human voice? Come on, who's there? Oh, radio drama? I said, who's there? Come on. Me. Who's me? And come out where I can see you. I mean it, right now. It answered me. Who is that? I must be losing my mind. This isn't rigged up to be a... What? Oh, nothing. It's just the... Oh. Great. Now I'm talking to it. Who is that? Alexa? You sound like an old troll or something. Watch your goddamn mouth, I'm warning you. If this isn't my imagination, and I'm really about to be saved, well then... I'm going to be rich very soon, and... What? Is that you, Alexa? <laughs> Come oh. on, who is it? An old troll, huh? All right. I'll throw sanity to the four winds. Just how old are you, may I ask? Uh, 18? 18. <laughs> Stop being an empty little... empty-headed little pipsqueak now and listen up. I'm in an emergency. And I don't have the exact coordinates as to where I am, but I need you to get off this frequency and send help as soon as possible. Frequency? What are you talking about? Would you really call this fair? Here I am, sitting on an old, comfy porch, drinking a cup of nice, warming, hot tea, while you're somewhere there in the bushes, getting all torn up, cold, uncomfortable, and only so that you can continue the stupid little joke that died five minutes ago. Now, why don't you come out and join me? It's that simple. And if you do, I'll be glad to go and fetch you a cup as well, okay? You're nowhere near a radio. That does it. Get out of those bushes now. Fine, I'll find you and beat the hell out of you. Where are you? Why are you coming in on my radio? Coming in on your what? Oh, don't toy with me. I've been lost at sea for many years. Wait till I find you. You really expect me to believe that? That somewhere in the year 2000, that there's somebody who doesn't know what a radio is. You really expect me to buy that, huh? I swear, I'm going to have your license revoked, you little shit. Hold it. What year did you say it was? 2000. Where are you? I'm in the year 2000. Where are you? It's 1918. You're serious. Hello? Well, young man, I, I do believe I've hit a time warp or something with this thing. That is, if you're not playing a wonderfully extended joke on me. Where are you? As I've been trying to tell you, I'm lost at sea, and I have been for many years. I thought I was pretty far south, but if you're speaking Russian, then you must be near the Soviet Union. But then I couldn't be. Where are you? Saratov. Saratov? Yes. Do you know where it is? Well, yes, but Saratov's inland. You're nowhere near the sea. 
No, I'm not near any sea, that's for certain. But you do know where Saratov is, then? Well, yes. I was stationed there for a short while. I'm only here until tomorrow. And then we're leaving to fight the Whites. Ah, oh. <laughs> the Civil War. <laughs> oh, that's what I was in Saratov for, too. I was awaiting transportation. You fought the Whites? I certainly did. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we fought together. Oh, oh yes. Oh yes, that's it. That must be the reason for all this. What? Well, don't you see? You must be an old friend come to console me. Yes, that's it. You're an old friend come to keep me company. <laughs> oh my god. What's your name? Piotr Andreevich. Hello? Wait. Are you still there? Yes. It sounds like you know me. Am I an old friend of yours? Do I really believe this? Do we really believe each other? Do you believe that I come from the year 2000? Yes. Why? Uh, I guess because you're not here. I've looked, and you're simply not here. Your voice is clear, but I can't figure out from which direction it's coming from. It's like it's coming at me from every direction. And I think I hear water? You really do believe it then? Yes. You never answered. Am I an old friend? No. <laughs> I'm afraid you're not. You're the cause of all my misfortune, actually. All that crap you're following now, never mind. Traitor, why don't you come out where I can see you? Oh, a typical threat, what a dope. I don't believe this. Young man, I don't know why I want to have this discussion with anyone anymore, but in all my years, I have yet to see what you believe in actually make anyone happy. How do you know what I believe in? Oh, I do. What do I believe in, then? At the moment, communism. Remember, I come from the year 2000, where I know you'll beat the whites. And I've seen communism cause little else but suffering for the Soviet people. I've watched it deprive people of a decent standard of living. I've watched it imprison people. No prosperity shall come from that system. Workers are- Oh, workers will display despair, a complete lack of initiative. No one will want to work or to produce simply because there's no reward for hard work or production. The slackers get as much money as the hard workers, so why be a hard worker, right? How about the knowledge that you're participating in something that's greater than yourself? <laughs> like what? A cause, I suppose. It's reward enough for me. It would be. Listen, you sick old man. I certainly hope I don't grow up to be anything like you. Oh, well, you will. Where are you? I've already told you where I am. I'm tired of what I'm hearing. Why don't you have the guts to give me something I can see and stop blathering on like an idiot? Oh, you think I'm blathering, huh? Well, maybe I am. I ask for a happy thought, and I get to tell you what I think of you. After all these years alone in this boat, this is my chance for some long-deserved petty satisfaction. And I'm not about to make nice-nice with the cause of all my misery. Which is what? Your naive and underdeveloped ideological elements, for starters. What I believe in? Yes. Old man, I'm fighting the ones that imprison, torture, murder, rape. I'm seeing the contrary to what you say, so I know you're wrong. Since last year, we've been in the process of getting the two-thirds of this country that can't read into schools. We're getting medicine to people who used to die in the streets while other people walked by wearing their excess winter coats and laughed till their stomachs hurt. Oh yes, I know. You fought the Tsar. You were always just such a hero, Pyotr. <laughs> then again, of course, three years ago you shot your own leg five times to get out of the army. Who the hell are you? There's a great famine coming soon where you are. 
Stock up on the essentials. Avoid the Siberian regions. What are you talking about? The system will have more than a few problems before it becomes remotely functional. I speak sarcastically, but of course where I'm from, I know this. Well, go back there then. Pyotr? What? My name's Pyotr too. Pyotr Andrevich, just like you. Why? Because I am you. Or you're me. Whatever. You were born in St. Petersburg in the year 1900 and moved to the country soon after. Your mother Kokoska died when you were seven. Your father Gregor still works as a lumberjack. He's one of those people you mentioned who can't read. You found this out on a night he was supposedly reading a story to you. He would hold a book open and make up stories as he went along, flipping the pages at random, so that you'd think he knew how to read. So that you would want to learn to read yourself. And one day, when you had started learning to read, you noticed the book he was reading to you from was upside down. And you've yet to tell him you know he can't read. Hello? I'm here. Do you believe me? Hello? Yes, I believe you. Good. Do you have time machines where you come from? No. Then why is all of this happening? It's a good question. You know, I think I may have something of an answer to that. What is it? Listen very carefully. I think I'm supposed to tell you things that will save my life and help me to prosper, help us to prosper. I think you can save our life. How? You must give up the fight. Go to America, start a business, prosper, thrive, buy, sell, uh, sell all investments in the stock market before 1929. And then, in the late 30s, build things for the government on a fat government contract. Then invest in tax-free municipal bonds. And... Hold on a minute. America? What the fuck? But, but we'll be rich! Just go! Uh, why would I want to? Are you idiot? This is a chance of a lifetime, our lifetime. Tax-free what? Communism's failed. I saw it happen. Everyone's no doubt making oodles of money in Soviet Russia. And I'm lost at sea. It's not fair! It's not fair! I was going to be rich! Wealth should be shared by one and all. Oh, shut up! It scares me that I'm to become you. Oh, don't you worry. You've many years ahead of you as an idle party member. Why, for years you'll be regarded as a man who is spirited, brave, and lustful for life. Others will comment on how they should live their life as fully as you lead yours. And you? Oh, you'll never experience petty emotions such as greed, vanity, or spite. No, not you, who is so spirited and brave and has such a lust for life. <laughs> oh, oh, the adventures you'll be able to recall when you're older. Tales of physical daring do, stories of rough and tumble barroom brawls where you alone mopped up the floor. The time you escaped through the earls on horseback. The jump from the train to escape capture by the whites. Ha. And you'll enjoy telling these stories to your co-workers. At the bank, where you'll be assigned for 50 years. A bank? Counting change! They're going to place me in a bank? Yes, they are! <laughs> in an office? Worse! A teller's window. You're going to learn to become a whipping boy. No more sleeping outside for you. No more wearing whatever you feel like. No more adventuring with others as adventurous as yourself. No more dreams of flying an airplane. So you might as well save yourself some time and get rid of these wishes now. There's no more fresh air for you. You're going to be assigned with men who hold the foreman's good words of evaluation as the most thrilling feeling they will feel in their miserable, petty lives. That's what you have to look forward to. 
50 years of it. Whether you know it or not right now, there will come a time in your life when you'll want to buy things. When there's no money to be made, people don't care about it, that's obvious. But when there's money out there, people want it. You'll want a big house, but you'll have to settle for your apartment. You'll want the best of everything for your family, for your children, but you won't be able to obtain it. And you don't know how much that hurts. I know you don't have a family yet, but you will. And having that family will make you want more money, whether you know it or not. Go to America. Pyotr, will you go? I might, but we'll beat the whites. In the Civil War? Yes, the Bolsheviks will win, but you mustn't be with them then. After the Civil War, they won't let you leave. They'll start denying exit visas, so you can't go fight. They won't let us leave? That isn't Marx. It doesn't matter, they'll do it. Answer me! I need to ask you a few questions first. Certainly. Go ahead. Well, first off, why would they place me in a bank? It hurts, doesn't it? I don't know. I thought we should have stayed in the army, maybe, but I always thought that we offended someone high up somewhere, somehow. We're all heart and all mouth, you and I, and we're not particularly smart. Will Americans ever be deprived of medicines because they don't have enough money? No, they won't. You're lying. All right, all right, yes, they will. But that's so meager if you compare it with How about education? Will the best education be reserved only for those who can afford it? Or will the best students finally receive the best education? There are some scholarships. So the answer is no. All right, y yes, but those are two things. And there are ways to make anything happen in America. Those two things are very important to me. So why won't you go fight for those things in America? Maybe. Yoda. It's you talking. Let's get some money for once in our life. Buy Arena some nice things and- Arena? My wife. Or your wife. She likes me? Enough! I'm sorry I mentioned it. I really am, but please take your eyes off of Arena for a moment and look at me. For close to 10 years now, I've lived on the water. Alone in this boat, eating nothing but s raw fish and seaweed. Sometimes I don't even get that. I have this imitation leather wristband from an old watch I just use as a sort of teether. When I'm hungry, it feels nice to simply partake in the act of chewing. Your jaw muscles get their exercise. The chewing induces saliva. Even as I speak, there's a group of sharks hovering around my little vessel, as they always do at this time of day. They always come right at the beginning of dusk, right on the button, and they stay for exactly 90 minutes. It's amazing. I know them all by name. I was able to name them by the imprints of green mold on the tops of their fins I see gliding around and around my craft. <laughs> They've been following my course for weeks, the same bunch, keeping me company. <laughs> I'm so lonely, I, I sometimes get desperate from the time when they'll come. They cheer me up. I'm bored. 
Each landless horizon I'm confronted with remains identical. It's like you never move. Dawns and sunsets come and go quickly, impatiently. Impatient to be rid of the event, inconsiderate of their lone audience member. Who'd just like for them to take their time once in a while? Oh, in my skin! My skin is likely the hardest in the world after all these years of salt air. My chest could stop a bullet. I go to sleep and wake up with water in my boat. My one curiosity, the one thing that keeps my mind from turning to mush, is the radio I'm hearing you on. It has magically sustained power for all these years. I don't know why. Well, to you who doesn't know what a radio is, it would seem a magical device indeed. You'd wonder how it works. How music and news events could be contained on a single thread of air. You'd be amazed. The static I get when there's no station nearby to pick up is... Nice, actually. I often listen to the static and pretend I'm the last man on Earth. I imagine that all land, vegetation, Earth has been covered with water and I alone have survived. The game makes it easier for me. When I think of all the money I'd be making now that there's free enterprise in the Soviet Union, You've mentioned that before. Yes, communism failed 10 years ago in 1990, the same year I set out in this boat. Everyone's no doubt making millions. I know I was going to. We all were. Oh, Russia must be so rich by now. Please, look past my greed and have some compassion. I've done the honest, hard-working bit. Let's be the privileged ones for once in a while. Our country is ripe for investment, and America always was. Take me away. There were nights which you might remember, nights where I, we were being hunted by government troops. We were lost, cold, we stood guard as friends slept, and we counted stars. Without a single possession to our name, we were looking up at the sky and wondering how it was possible that such magical things could exist. Those nights, like every other beautiful experience I remember from my life thus far, however short that is, those experiences weren't made wonderful by money. Oh, God. Money never resulted in any of the truly good times I've had in my life. Did it in yours? Oh, he's trying to be a poet about it. I'm asking you honestly, sincerely, did money have anything to do with the best times of your life? You're saying no to me, aren't you? Did it? How would I know I never had it? I, I can't go to America. I mean, this is my life. I'm going to fight the whites. I, I'm not old. I'm sorry you are, but I'm not. And uh, Irina likes me. I, I don't know why I can't leave. I just can't. Uh, haven't you listened to a word I've just said? I have. And, and I think I believe everything you're saying, but I don't know you at all. And I'm afraid I really don't like you. Oh. Really? Not a bit. So. I get to... Stay at sea, then. I guess so, yes. I can't believe this is happening. I've got to go inside. Oh, wait! Wait just a damn minute! 
If you're really going to leave me alone, then you could at least have the compassion to do me a one favor. Please! I feel like I've been sentenced to suffer this twice. What is it? I think we can save ourselves these seafaring years at least, and quite easily at that. In 72 years, can you just remember not to set out on a boat? Can you remember to do that for me? I know it's a long time and it might be hard to remember, but Yes. I... You will? You promise? Yes, sir. I'll try to remember. Oh. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Good luck. Uh, thank you. And remember, 72 years, write it down! Oh, he's gone. Oh, here it comes now. We're going to prosper in the Soviet Union. Close our eyes. Concentrate. He didn't remember. Hello? Hello? You're still there? Oh, oh yes, I'm still here. It, it didn't seem right for me to leave like that. Oh, oh thank you for coming back. You understand, don't you? Oh. I'm glad you live in a world at peace. Must be nice. But I don't. I live in a time where a lot of people are dying. I'm a witness to it. It's right in front of my face. I can't run away from that. I don't know. Don't you remember any of it? A little. What changed me? Oh, I don't know. I could blame a man named Stalin. I could blame Nazis, the Germans. They'll kill 19 million of us. I could blame the 45 years after that, which just made for a depressing life. I could blame the years in a bank. I could also blame myself. I'm not going to remember any of this, am I? What? Do you remember any of this? Hearing a voice in the air during an evening in Saratov while you were sitting on a porch drinking a cup of tea? Do you remember being my age and having all of this happen to you? No. No, I don't. I won't remember any of this after I leave you. No, I won't. I I'm not going to remember any of this history. Or, or that Irina likes me. Or that I won't get to fly. Or, or that I'll live to be a hundred and I know the future. 72 years from now, I'm not going to remember to avoid going out on a boat. Uh, I know. Here, write it down. Uh, then you'll remember. Have you got a pen? Uh, yes, I do. It's right here in my bag. No! 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 Huh? No! No! Oh, somewhere back in 1918, his little mind is being wiped clean. Wait a minute. Maybe I went back in time. And now it's 1918 and when I hit land there'll be a world war ending. And cars will have to be wound up. And I'll have the first working radio ever made and I'll get rich because of it. And, and... No. I 
guess not. And so, the man who was once so spirited and brave and had such a lust for living fell asleep was made to drift for years and years, lamenting his long, sad, stupid life before passing away amongst the same stars he once counted on watch 80 years ago. Gentlemen, how are we all today? <laughs> I've had company. I'm sorry if I've neglected you. Ah, I see Sherninko's got in himself a tortoise shell. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gentlemen, we've got a lot of talking to do. Ah, I've got lots of thinking to do. Uh, oh, gentlemen, the things I was going to do. Cross deserts, explore the Arctic, climb the Himalayas. I used to imagine I was flying an airplane by myself, no co-pilot. And it's an older plane from the 30s or so. Think hard, gentlemen. Anyway. I'm cruising slowly at 10,000 feet. It's at night, and I'm flying over the sea. When among the stars, I see Arena's face drawn out across the entire sky, and she's smiling at me. I shake it off and try and press on. And as I hold my course steady, I see her again. Except this time she's up on a cloud, waiting for me. And I've been so lonesome. So, I start to climb. And as I gain more and more altitude, the more wonderful I feel. It's more fear and thrill than I've felt in all my life. And then, my plane begins to rumble and creak and crack, and instruments begin to pop out of their sockets, and then quietly, without a sound, my plane falls apart. The side panels and the wings disengage from each other. And as I make it up the rest of the way, by myself to Arena's side, the debris from my craft is blown away by the wind and falls silently into the sea. And I'm there with Arena. Forever. And that's the last that anyone ever saw or heard of me. Goodbye, comrade.
Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dewey Scott Wiley. I'm the director of theater at USC Aiken, and I've got some folks to introduce you to. Um, I'm going to introduce my friend, playwright of Piotr's Magic Radio, Michael John Carley, who is joining us for this talk back from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, the director of the show, Andrew Randolph. How are you guys doing? The actors, Angelo Gooch as old Piotr, and Hello. Jackson Coleman is young Piotr. And Hi. Leah Tucker, our stage manager, is joining us as well. Um, so I had the good fortune of, of getting to um, direct a reading of this play this summer at Spectrum Theater Ensemble up in Providence. And so that's how Michael and I knew each other. And uh, when Drew was looking for a play, I said, hey, you might want to read this one. I think you might really like it. <laughs> so uh, what, my first question, I guess, Drew, is... Uh, what what appealed to you about this play? Oh, uh, um, I really enjoyed the just kind of the relationship aspect of it. Um, it's very personal, uh, you know. Obviously, when you're having a fight with your younger self, I mean, it's not often we get to do that in real life. And I think um, the opportunity to get to work with something like that on stage is just so appealing because I think there's so many times where that's exactly what we want to do, right? We want to go back and say, you know, what were you thinking? You know, what were you thinking there? And just have that moment where we can really look at our younger self or our older self and, and just ask them those important questions. So I don't know. I just, I really find that fascinating about the play. Cool. Um, so uh, Jackson and Angela, what, what did you guys think when you first started working on this piece? Oh, I was definitely really excited to work on it, <laughs> especially when he told me that I got to be the old guy. <laughs> uh, I don't it's you know, it's just a really, really cool dynamic to get to have a literal argument with yourself, but also yeah. to like argue with two versions of yourself that are almost completely different but are still kind of the same guy you know it, it just seemed like something i really wanted to get into like <laughs> cool yeah it was How about you, Jackson? it was definitely an interesting um play overall just the dynamic between the two and also the dynamic uh, and how timely things are with things going on in the world today and just the message of the play it was just really, I felt timely and the dynamic made it fun to work with as well. Cool. I, um, I, I think it's really interesting, right? Cause like I got a chance to work on this play in July and um, you know, now that we're what, like 20 days away from the election or something like that, I, uh, I, all those lines about you can do anything in America and, and just just the political debate that goes on in this play, I was like, ooh, it's even more crackly now, right? Like it, it, it was just so much more palpable to me uh, than it was even in July when I thought it was pretty live. Um, I think one of the really interesting things, and I, I'd love Michael John to talk about this, is that you wrote this play in 1990 and it's set in 2000 and um, you know that that took some like magical foresight on your part to to imagine um, what I guess you're imagining what old Piotr is imagining happened to Russia at the time you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that that's a yeah fun sure I mean you know it was it was fairly you know the attraction for capitalism in Russia obviously around that time was just so ferocious that you knew that, you know, whether they succeeded at it or not, they were going to dive into the concept with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and, you know, that I don't think you had to be any great brain of a political forecaster to, to kind of see that coming. Um, we were just sort of riding, you know, this very, you know, high in terms of, you know, the stock market was suddenly entering a phase that it had never, you know, really seen before. Um, you know, we were on the verge of, you know, obviously the tech companies suddenly, you know, suddenly, you know, breaking all kinds of stock market records. So, you know, it was, it was really something that was in the air that 
again, you know, it didn't, you know, take, take a big brain to be able to foresee coming. But it was also a subject that, you know, for me had a lot of poignancy, just as somebody who never really used the word socialism back then, only because those that, you know, would profess to be socialists were, I'll be honest, really embarrassing. Um, they would constantly use the word imperialism in every other sentence. And when it came down to context or critical thinking, they were just absolutely nowhere. And so I, as a closet case, you know, socialist, you know, had only one venue, you know, to get things out of my system. And that was through my art. And so this to me was something also that not only honored that, but also honored, um, I don't know why the interest in this concept came up, but, you know, we do tend to feel so foreign, you know, from as we grow older, from our childhood selves. Mm -hmm. And if we can maybe just understand, you know, how naturally and how rightfully each side is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing actually in that moment and that they're not stabbing the other side in the back. Um, you know, young people are supposed to live, they're supposed to have ideals, they are supposed to want to feel that there are things out there that they would die for. And I really believe that. Um, and I don't think we have that as much today. So, you know, what young Piotr, for instance, is experiencing, I think was something that is usually the cultural property of the right when they talk about dying in wars, but really it's all about ideals. You know, it's not just wars, it's all of ideals. And I think people of all political persuasions need to feel that because it just, you know, it, it just puts them in such a different place in how they relate to other people on planet earth. It's not about just us. Yeah, and, and I think it's cool because like, uh, I think you and I are about the same age so we can like relate to the looking back at your younger self thing. But I think yep. it's so neat that, that college students can get excited about this piece because they understand the other side of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I think there's a, a timelessness built into the play in that respect. No, it's a great, and that's honestly, that's the best compliment that, you know, you guys can give me, you know, it really is. And, you know, and I think that Dewey and I probably are counting ourselves as, as like really lucky. I mean, I'm 55, um, but the fact that, you know, we haven't lost sight of that, you know, and that we probably aren't going to either that I can, you know, profess with full confidence for. So, um, so that's, that's a, uh, that's a great point, Dewey. Yeah. And uh, what about some of the, the uh, socialist um, messaging that was in the play? Did that strike you guys as uh, relevant to, you know, what, what's going on politically today? I mean, did you have any thoughts when you were <laughs> working on the piece? Like, huh, this play has a lot to say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, de definitely uh, young people just part really like, hey, man, we're trying to give medicine to everybody. And it's like, wow, that's really relevant right now. Yeah. A different kind of medicine, but. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree uh, with Gooch. I, I just, um, I mean, obviously being a student, the, the part about the education and the, um, I mean, medicine as well. I mean, it just resonates with you, you know, like how, how do we make it more affordable and, and provide that um, people can just get a good education at not outrageous prices. Um, so, yeah. I'm sure a lot of college students can relate to that. Yeah, of course. Those sentiments a great deal. Um, so I have a another question for all of you and Leah, please chime in. Um, I feel very fortunate that we get to, um, you know, connect with playwrights like Michael John across the country in this new sort of virtual landscape that we're in. And I feel very fortunate that we're able to do some theater um, this semester. We are um, making theater this semester. Michael John, this is one of three plays that we're doing and we're recording them all, but we're, you know, rehearsing them and doing them in a theater. And my theater management class is uh, producing them and building the sets and costumes and props and and working on the lights and so we're in the trenches and making some theater together in these difficult times um so what's what's that been like for you guys to be able to to get to do some some theater even though we don't have a live audience which is 50 percent of the equation of course but what's it been like well, for me at least um 
Dewey and I were working on a show that was canceled because of COVID <laughs> um, in the spring. So that was really interesting and really heartbreaking to, to not be able to do theater, like especially since we were like two weeks away from putting it up. Yeah, not even like um, 10 days. We had like 10 days and we would have been open. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that really hurt. And then, and then throughout the summer, I wasn't able to participate in any virtual shows or anything because where I live, where I was sent back to because of COVID, I don't have an internet connection. <laughs> so, um, so that was really hard not, to, not being able to stage manage, like, even though I'd, I'd planned to, and I'd, I had job offers throughout. And so I didn't know what I would be coming back to when school started in the fall. And I didn't know if we'd be able to do theater at all. But the fact that we get to do three shows, and that they're they're all really meaningful and really cool shows that that are a good time and like even though they're only 30 minute shows each of them they're still really good and refreshing to do since we didn't have a time where we could do much of anything before awesome anybody else want to talk about making theater in these uh in yeah um i i'd say uh just getting back on stage there's an abs like an energy to it that you miss out when you're doing readings over zoom i mean just just getting into a theater and then starting the process um, from the very first rehearsal up until uh, when we're recording it i mean the excitement that's there and just the feeling of getting to work with other creative people and ask questions and and then ask more questions after you've asked those questions um i mean it's just amazing and especially when you haven't been able to do it um, it's especially when it's something that's out of your control that uh, doesn't allow you to do it. When you get when you finally get back in, um, it's just amazing. Like the energy when you get back is uh, just wonderful. So, yeah, I mean, me and uh, Andrew over the the summer we <laughs> we did a two man Zoom show together, and oh my god. Even just having a stage, even if you am being together on stage when you're performing together, even if you don't have an audience, is so many miles better than that. Like it's, it feels, yeah, it's so exciting to get to do this. It's like, and it's amazing. And uh, I, I straight up told my advisor, I was like, I'm only coming to campus this semester if I get to an opportunity to work in some live theater. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm so happy this is happening. Yeah. One step closer, right? And then we get yeah. the live audience back. We're sneaking them back in. That's right. <laughs> I will say, um, I never got to do a Zoom show or anything like that. So I don't quite, I'm not quite able to feel the difference between that and just having the stage back. So having the stage back is really good. I will say just this right now, Knowing, knowing that there is no live audience and that things are being recorded. Just that even being in the theater feels so different than a normal live show because it's always just there in the back of your head. Um, and I, know, I don't know, it's just presented for challenge, even though we're presenting through the same means going just on a show on the stage. But it just presents a different challenge. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, we, we've, we've got to keep creating, whether it's virtually or some kind of hybrid model like we're doing this semester where we're doing the, the theater together in the space as opposed to in the format that we're on right now. Um, and, uh, and we're getting to share it with the campus and, and our audience um, in some way, right? And so we'll, we'll keep taking baby steps till we can get back safely and get back together. Dewey, yeah. can I just chime in one, one thought on that level? And that is that I think that there is still a mistake that folks our age sometimes make. And that is that, especially with COVID, especially as parents who adore our children and who fret like crazy over, over this and the impact it's going to have on them, that we sometimes forget how resilient kids are. And that we sometimes actually have to remember that, you know, everybody grows up into their own generational world and they adapt. And especially, I think, given that their generation and the generation before that has been criticized fairly heavily for, as Cambridge's David Runciman likes to say, being programmed to become incapable of resistance. Well, now they have to adapt. Now the programming is going out the window and they're adapting. And I think that they're going to be fine. 
And they're adapting brilliantly. That's yeah, a great way to close. Yeah. Michael John, thank you so much for sharing this gem of a play. And thank you all for all your hard work. I'm really excited to show it to the campus. Thanks for joining us today. Can I also just say, you know, thank you to everybody, but especially to Andrew. Andrew, you're the reason why this happened. It's been a pleasure to work with you and just much appreciate everything. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael John. It's been my absolute pleasure. Cool. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much. We really Have a great night, y'all. Bye, you. comrade. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>